about Grainne Whale. She's kind of like Pocahontas to us, so we're, we're, we're very familiar with her. Um, and a lot of stories are probably not very true, just as stories about Pocahontas or what was the name of that lady that was on the um, the expedition? Sakatuwe, yeah, Sakatuwe. Actually, I like her even more than Pocahontas. I think she was a she was a very interesting lady. Yeah. Okay, I'm getting the the ears back there. Let me just put this down. I might do that, yeah. Well, he wants to be talking into this thing. Okay. Okay, now I finished eating. Um, I don't know how I'm going to speak about it because there's so much that I could say about her and about herself personally. So I'll try and keep it as personal as I can about her what she must have been like as a, as a person. She was born, by the way, in 1530, um, which, as you probably know, was about when Henry VIII, you've all heard about Henry VIII, was King of England. And um, she was about the same age as Elizabeth I, Henry's daughter, with Anne Boleyn. And uh, they actually met and... We'll get to that a little later. That's one of the great interesting moments in British and Irish history when those two characters met. And um, <clears throat> I'm sure you'll enjoy that, that part of it. Um, so I'll try not to, you know, bore you with battles and all the usual things that one talks about in history and see if I can't make, make, it, make her um, a real-life person and try and get some idea of the age in which she lived. The, the maps, unfortunately, we don't have our PowerPoint, but the, the, map, the map of Ireland, you all have a rough idea what the map of Ireland looks like. Well, the area of Ireland that she um, is associated with is the west coast of Ireland, and specifically a place called Clue Bay. Clue, C-L-E-W, Clue Bay. Um, means something slightly different in Irish, but... Um, and by the way, the, the English language would have been very, very rare. It, it wasn't until very much later that English became um, spoken widely in Ireland. So it was very much the Irish language, the old Gaelic language, that um, she would have spoken and uh, everybody that she knew spoke. But also at that time, <clears throat> educated people in Europe generally, and certainly in Ireland, spoke Latin and wrote and spoke Latin. And when she actually went and met Queen Elizabeth uh, in the 1590s, when they were both in their late 60s, um, they spoke in Latin. Not just wrote, they spoke freely in Latin, which is extraordinary. Um, Granuel, or Grace, <clears throat> also spoke Spanish because she... Uh, went to Spain many, many times. You'll read in some of the books that she went once. Well, no, she would have gone many, many times because her father was the chief of a, um, a maritime, a coastal community uh, in Clube, and um, there would have been a tradition of trading with Spain going back thousands of years, many thousands of years. And... It's interesting that his name was Duh Dara. I'm not sure what the Dara means, uh, but Duh was certainly black. So if you ever heard jokes about the black Irish, they often refer to them the black hair. And there are, if, you, uh, if you've ever been to Ireland, you'll see in the west coast of Ireland particularly, you'll see um, people who have very Latin-looking features. They, they're very dark, curly hair. Well, not curly, but dark almost what you'd quintessentially recognize today as a, a, a Spanish Latino looking person. So um, he obviously had some of that, he looked like that, which would make sense to me because uh, there was a very close affinity between the West Coast and, and Spain. 
So when I say that she would have gone there many, many times, um, we know that as a, as, a, as a young girl, one of the things that distinguished her from a lot of other girls was that she thought she was a boy. <laughs> and um, she used to steal aboard her father's uh, ship. Now, he had anything up to two or three hundred ships. So he was a very significant uh, seafaring, a sea whatever, power. Um, and they, they not only went to Spain on trading trips, but they also circumnavigated the island of Ireland and most everywhere into England and the continent. So these are people that would know every nook and cranny of uh, Britain and Ireland and most of the west coast of Europe. But their traditional um, trading route was to Spain. And the things that they brought down there were, was wool and corn. Not the kind of corn that you think of when you think of corn, but European corn, in the, uh, which was um, uh, oats, barley, wheat, and so on, which they grew in abundance, particularly on the west coast of Ireland. There's a big valley there, well, a plain, uh, in, in Mayo, in the west coast of Ireland, which is protected from the ocean breeze, uh, the ocean storms, <clears throat> by a range of mountains, a number of ranges of mountains, and yes, has the, the warm uh, oceanic air, so that it was a very mild climate, and it grew crops early and late, you know, it would have grown two crops, maybe not the same uh, crop, but it certainly would have grown root crops and it would have grown um, uh, cereal crops. Uh, so very, very productive, very deep soil. So it would have been like the, the San Joaquin Valley of, of, uh, of, of, the, of the period. Um, and if you ever go there, you'll see uh, mile after mile after mile of these little uh, fields with stone walls. So they grew all of that corn within the stone walls. And the stone walls were to protect the, um, the, the, the uh, cereal crops, the oats and barley and so on, and to keep the cattle out, and to also rotate them. Um, and as I said before, one of, they also grew a lot of cattle and sheep, and they brought the manure down from the, where the cattle ran sort of free range and... Um, uh, your uh, allocation of infield or uh, um, fields to grow corn depended on how many cattle you had because that's how much fertilizer you had. So if you had a lot of... So cattle were still the, essentially the measure of wealth um, <clears throat> because it had a knock-on effect, if you like, on the, um, the amount of um, cereal you could grow. Um, and everything was done by hand, so they had grind, grindstones and so on. But uh, the Irish um, oats was very valuable, uh, especially further south, because um, it was hard to grow that kind of food in warmer, drier climates. And of course, then wool off the mountains was in abundance. They would have had as much wool as New Zealand has today. So they didn't grow those for themselves. They grew to trade, for trade. So uh, when Duftara O'Malley would have set off with, who knows, 30, 40, 100, who, whatever, maybe not in one uh, go, but he would probably bring at least a couple of dozen of ships with him um, <clears throat> because they would travel in like a convoy because there was a lot of piracy going on at the time. So they had to defend themselves, and just like during the Second World War, when uh, America was provide was supplying Europe, they went in convoys, and they were it was better. To, there's there's safety in number, so to speak. Um, so they were warriors too, and while there would have been sailors, and there would have been traders, and there would have been um, a lot of expertise on the on the ships. There would also be quite a, a, an element of uh, hard-bitten fighting men. And there's some num numerous stories of encounters with Barbary pilots. Pilots, pirates. I'm sure you've heard of the Barbary Coast. 
Yes, you have. And I don't mean the, the, the uh, uh, waterfront in San Francisco in the um, 80, late 1800s, because that's what it was called, the Barbary Coast, but it was because it was a rough and tumble um, American town. But anyway, the Barbary Coast was not, and notorious for pirates uh, in that period, in the 1500s and 1600s. They weren't really wiped out until much later. And they're sort of, that we don't think of pirates very much nowadays, but in those days they were kind of like the equivalent of the, of the Bin Ladens and the, the terrorists. They were the scourge of the day.